Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator and Easton Antique Arms, and let's talk a little bit about Victorian Highland officers' swords. Now, um, for anybody who doesn't know, um, Highland regiments within the British Army had their own styles of uniform, they had their own styles of sword as well, and they retained the basket hilt when the basket hilt generally had fallen out of military use elsewhere. And in fact, they still have the basket hilt today. So if you look up um, the Highland regiments today, you will see that they still, the officers, still use this form of basket hilt. This one dates to probably about the 1850s or 60s, um, but they still use uh, something similar to this, the 1828 pattern um, basket hilt. It does look a bit different for a start. The modern ones are shinier, um, but they're also cast um, hilts. Uh, these Victorian ones, at least the mid-Victorian ones, are actually uh, forged. Um, so they do look a little bit different. So if you're looking at Victorian era basket hilted officers swords, although it's the same model, it's the same pattern fundamentally, they did update it later on in the 19th century slightly, aesthetically, um, but uh, they are constructed in a slightly different way. It has to be said, I, I much prefer the look of these earlier forged ones because they look more like a real proper basket hilt in my eyes. Now, for you will notice, of course, if you uh, Google images, for example, of Highland Regiment officers, you'll also find out uh, that they wore, they wear kilts. In some cases, they wore uh, plaid, or commonly known as tartan, trousers as well, rather than um, kilts in some uh, geographic conditions where it was considered that trousers were more, more practical than kilts. Um, they also have their own style of jackets, their own style of hats. They're very particular. They often carried, um, the officers carried dirks as well. The dirk became more ceremonial and decorative, although they still had functional blades on them. I've personally never seen a service sharpened one, uh, so I think by and large they became pretty much ceremonial objects in the 19th century. But the swords were still used in combat, and they are still functional basket hilted swords um, and they were used right well right the way through the 19th century for example they were used in the Crimean War there are examples of, of these being used in combat uh, they were used in um, the uh, in wars in India the Sikh wars and also the um, the Indian mutiny so-called Indian mutiny they were used in um, you know uh, China for example they were used in Afghanistan they were used all over the British Empire and beyond anywhere really that the British Army saw combat if there were Highland regiments there, then these saw use. Now, the way that they were used in this period was actually pretty much the same way that a sabre was used. So uh, for most of the 19th century, it would have been Henry Angelo's um, infantry sword exercise was used with these. They didn't differentiate, at least on paper, they didn't differentiate between how these swords were used and how the um, infantry officer's sabre was used. <laughs> By pure coincidence, I was like, have I got an infantry officer's sabre around? Yes, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six uh, preparing to go up on the website for sale. So yes, I have got a bunch of them around. Here is one in particularly nice condition. Um, so this um, infantry officer's style sabre, that the hilt came in in 1822, the blade, this type of blade came in in 1845, the fuller blade. Look on Eastern Antique Arms website if you want to learn more about the real nitty gritty details of this and I've got a whole bunch of articles on there which um, hopefully will be of interest to you. And um, this was the standard infantry officer's sword uh, but for those people in Highland regiments as mentioned they had this sword. Now many of you will note that obviously there are some functional differences. The main functional differences between this sword and the, uh, the sabre here is that the sabre has what's called a half basket hilt. That is, it has a knuckle bow and a form of, you could call it shell or bowl guard above the hand. Whereas, of course, the basket hilt has a full basket. So this is a full basket, the sabre is a half basket. That's how they were known anyway. Um, this is also an iron hilt, whereas that particular one is a brass hilt. This is obviously therefore greater protection in terms of area, but it's also structurally much, much stronger. Of course, rifles officers, I happen to have a rifles officer sword over here, in fact I've got several of them, um, but this one uh, is a steel hilt. Uh, although it's basically the same design as, or very similar design, to the uh, infantry officer's sword, it has a steel hilt instead of a brass hilt, and of course, structurally, steel is stronger than brass. Uh, it was a criticism of those brass tilts that they could be damaged uh, either in combat or just generally carrying them around if you drop them for example and steel hilts were better therefore some people some officers did get infantry officers did get the 
uh, their hilts, instead of being brass, they had them made of steel, and then they had them gilded so that they looked the right colour for parade purposes, but structurally they had the strength of iron or steel. These hilts already come in iron or steel, so very, very, very good hand protection. And the blade, the blade is different. So obviously, first of all, it's straight. You do get some variations of the infantry officer's sword with a straight blade. Um, having a very slight curve or a straight blade doesn't make an awful lot of difference. Having a slight curve does help with slightly with edge alignment. But a more notable functional difference between this sword, the Highland officer's sword um, blade and the saber blade is that this is double edged. Now it must be said that the service sharpened ones I've seen aren't always service sharpened on both edges and of course one of the reasons is with a medieval sword and we'll look at a cross hilted sword in a little bit with a cross hilted sword if one edge gets damaged or blunted you can flip it around and use uh, the back edge so if we're talking about a uh, medieval style sword something like uh, this St Morris sword for example if one edge gets mashed up or just isn't sharp enough you can flip it around and use the other edge it's one of the advantages of um, having two edges you can't really do that when you've got a basket hilt because the basket hilt enforces you holding it in one direction that being said having a long rear edge if you do sharpen it does mean you can do back edge cuts which can come from angles which the front edge can't always replicate um, so you can come around uh, if it, and this starts to get like almost like medieval messer technique but you can can come around people's guards and hit with the back edge equally you can do something called a manchette which is an upwards cut uh, underneath someone's hand but i have to say with the uh, regulation infantry officer's saber they were sharpened for the end of the blade here so you can do manchette and they were taught with the back edge but it's not quite so easy because you've got less edge to play with, as it were, less edge to use. So having a full back edge, I think, is advantageous in that way. But as always on this channel, I try to point out that when you gain something, you lose it. What do you lose? Well, first of all, you lose the fact that you've got lost uh, that kind of rigidity of having the curved blade. But also the single edged curved blade, the saber blade, has a very stiff back and it's a, quite a stiff blade. So either in cutting or thrusting, it has a certain amount of rigidity to it. One of the disadvantages of the so-called claymore blades, as they called them at the time, the double-edged um, blades that we find on Highland officers' swords, is that they are more flexible. That being said, an advantage, if we go back to the advantages, is that they have a cross-section which cuts very well. It has very little friction passing through a target. So you can see there's some advantages, some disadvantages. Basically, they're just different, but you can use them in pretty much the same way. In terms of use, one thing which is noted in the 19th century sources is the way that you can hold the hilt is slightly more restricted with a full basket hilt. I've discussed this a lot, uh, but with a um, saber hilt, you can put the thumb up the back and have the hand right down here and get a good alignment between the blade and the grip and your forearm, uh, which enables you to cut with very good reach. Um, with a basket hilt, it depends on the size of the basket hilt as to whether you can do that or not, but there is a constriction, and I just have to get the tassel out of the way, the tassel's decorative purposes, but it does actually make the sword slightly more comfortable to hold. Um, you've got these sidebars. Now I've talked about this detail before and you'll notice that these sidebars are actually connected quite far forward on this Victorian example. If we look at earlier examples from the say 18th or 17th century, those bars are attached quite at the side and you really can't get the thumb up the back and get this kind of angled grip. You can do a handshake grip but not that much because the bars project out sideways from the junction with the pommel. With this Victorian example, you'll see that the sidebars are set forward, and that is precisely to allow you to hold it a little bit more similarly to a saber and have a bit more of a canted grip. This means that you can reach further with your cut. It also means you can deliver the point or thrust a little bit more easily as well. If you're enforced in having quite an angled grip like that, then you can get, still get a very powerful cut, but much like a talwar, it means you need to be closer to land the blade on the target. And when it comes to thrusting, you can't get the blade in a straight line with the uh, forearm, as you can if you put the thumb up the back. You have to thrust from angles, which again reduces your reach. And you could say reduces some of the repertoire available to you for using the point of the sword. So this design, both the hilt and the blade, definitely changes what you can and can't do with the sword, or at least modifies it, affects how you use the sword. 
Um, that being said, as I said at the beginning, this type of sword was used fundamentally with the same method as the infantry officer saber. And an interesting sort of tan related tangent is that many of you will have heard of Captain Alfred Hutton because I refer to him quite a lot and I study his works possibly going to publish something about him at some point. I've certainly done a bunch of research, which probably I should put out there in some form or another. Um, and I teach his methods, and I'm a fan of his works in general, particularly his earlier stuff, actually. And well, his earlier stuff and his latest stuff, not so much the stuff in the middle. Um, but what's interesting is he's most known for teaching the sabre. But he actually started off in the Cameron Highlanders when he commissioned in I think it was 1861 or 1862, 61, I can't remember now, but 61 or 62, he joined the Cameron Highlanders in India and they had actually been fighting through the Indian mutiny and stayed in India for the mopping up operations in Oud and elsewhere after the mutiny. And obviously the uh, British government at the time was fearful that the mutiny might continue or flare up again, so they put a lot of British forces into India to enforce their control there. Um, and the Cameron Highlanders were one of the regiments, the Cameronians as they're sometimes known, uh, were one of the regiments that were based in India in the early 1860s when Alfred Hutton commissioned as an officer, as a second lieutenant I presume. Um, and so he went out to India and joined the Cameron Cameronians and he was a very experienced fencer already. He had actually been a personal student of Henry Angelo Jr. Uh, who published the infantry sword exercise and he actually became the uh, fencing instructor to the Cameronians so despite the fact that they fought through the mutiny and were militarily experienced men they weren't necessarily fantastic fencers and there's an anecdote about him arriving at the regiment and the kind of uh, drill instructor um, can't remember whether he was an NCO or an officer now, um, but he basically said, oh, well, you know, you've got all this fencing equipment, let's have a go. And so they had a few fencing bouts and like Hutton basically owned him and he was like, right, you set up a fencing school. And so he did and he published his first book in, I think, 1862 particularly for the Cameronians, um, but it's very clearly based on Angelo's method because he was Angelo's student. So Hutton himself was in a regiment and presumably he had one of these because he was in the Cameron Highlanders. Highland Regiment, the officers, we've got photos of them from the time, they were equi equipped with these basket hilts. Um, so he would have had a sword like this. So despite the fact that he had a basket hilt like this, the method he was teaching was Angelo's regulation sabre method uh, illustrated with these types of swords and predominantly used with these types of swords but he didn't mention anything different or do anything different for the fact that he himself and his regiment used these swords they just used them the same way right the next thing I want to talk about is changes of hilt so we talked a lot about the basket hilt um, but this wasn't the only hilt to be found on these Highland blades. So if you were in a Highland regiment, it could be the Black Watch or the Cameronians or whoever, um, then you had a so-called Claymore blade. Now what defines the Claymore blade at this point is it is straight, it is double-edged. It usually has a double fuller in the middle section of the blade around here. Sometimes the fillers are longer, sometimes they're shorter, sometimes there's only a single filler. Sometimes there's been some suggestion there's regimental tendencies, so some regiments preferred a certain fuller design over others. I'm not so sure about that, but anyway. Um, usually a double fuller, as you can see here in this blade in the middle section, and then two fullers down here. Now, those of you who are well educated on the world of medieval and Renaissance swords will recognise that these, uh, this Ricasso, at the base, this Ricasso accompanied by, just get the, there we go, this Ricasso accompanied by two fullers at the base of the blade is something that we find on medieval swords going all the way back to about the year 1400 on type 19, oak, oak shot type 19 blades. And that's where this originates. So there is a direct connection between these Victorian Highland officers' swords and swords found in Uatokshot's typology and used in Italy and Malta and um, Spain and um, to some extent uh, Northern Europe as well in around the year 1400 and right the way through the 15th century. And these types of blades survived on both um, continental, what we would call side swords, I guess, but also they were exported and brought into Scotland and Britain and put on basket hilts. So when they came to design a when the Victorian officers basket hilt, they simply looked at earlier basket hilts and took design elements from it. And that's how they ended up with this basically oak shot type 19 blade. So it's amazing. It's a Victorian officer's sword that basically has 
a sword which you can find on Uotoke Shot's typology and was a sword that was around in the time of the Battle of Agincourt. It's kind of crazy. Um, and, and, you know, in fairness, they realised that's what it was. It was supposed to be a cultural uh, continuation or at least revival, really. And this ties into Sir Walter Scott's revival of Highland uh, pride and traditions. It links into the fact that in the 18th century, in the middle of the 18th century, Battle of Culloden, the Highland clearances, there was this... Um, crushing of the Highland culture and then there was a gradual kind of British official reviving and recreation of Highland culture. So famously kilts, modern kilts are basically a, a sort of 18th century, 19th century invention um, to bring Highland culture and make it a British thing and tie it into British national pride and use it as a military institution, create Highland regiments, blah, blah, blah. So the design of this sword is actually extremely historically interesting and also very politically complex and culturally complex. But that's what we ended up with. Now, the basket hilt. So the basket hilt had it, its exponents, and I should say, whilst there are limitations to the basket hilt, and I'm personally not a huge fan of basket hilts because I'm used to using sabres and I find them very restrictive, as most other Victorian writers, <laughs> I'm not a Victorian writer, but as most Victorian writers also found them uh, quite restrictive and had a similar view to them as, as I do, Basket hilts did have their fans, and there were in fact some people who had completely custom-made sabres and swords for themselves going out to India, where they thought, I need a really good sword because I might actually use it. Unlike in Europe, I might actually use a sword out there in India or Afghanistan or China or wherever. And there were some of them that actually got basket hilts put on their swords, despite the fact they weren't in a Highland regiment and they didn't even come from a Highland background. Some of them were English or Irish or whatever. Um, so you do find these hilts sometimes married to sabre blades and other things because people recognised they were extremely good hand protection. And also just remember, these usually had a leather liner inside them as well. Not always, but they often had a buff leather liner. So even these holes would have been blocked by thick not impenetrable, but very protective leather. Um, so these hilts did have their exponents and fans. However, generally speaking, 19th century swordsmen weren't, and bearing in mind they didn't have a specific method for use for these basket hilts, they weren't looking at 18th century manuals by, um, by McBain or, or you know, Zachary Wilde or whoever. They were looking at 19th century sabre manuals and they were finding these hilts a bit restrictive. So what we do find, and here is a lovely example that I'll tell you a little bit of the history about in a second, um, we do find sabre hilts put onto these Highland uh, broadsword blades. And um, this is a Highland broadsword blade. It's exactly the same design with those two fullers at the base and then two fullers in the middle of the blade. Um, and it's, as you can see, it's, yeah, it's exactly the same design. It's just a little bit bigger. So it's the same width, actually. I was going to say it's broader, but it's not. It's the same width. It's just a tiny bit longer. And that was just personal preference. This is a Wilkinson example. And it was ordered as a uh, custom piece uh, from... Um, uh, from Wilkinson and the officer wanted it to be slightly longer. Now this was actually owned, I won't go into the, the full biographical details of the officer, I might have spoken about him previously. This was owned by an officer who'd actually served in the Indian Mutiny in 1857 and 58 and it was at the second siege of Lucknow. During the storming, this wasn't the sword he had incidentally, the sword he had probably was like this, okay, probably had a basket hilt. Um, and he was at the uh, uh, second um, uh, the second siege of Lucknow, there were two sieges of Lucknow, um, and uh, he, during the siege, there was a breach in the wall, he went in with a fellow officer kind of leading his men, and uh, as he stuck his head through this hole in the wall, someone with a tolwa behind the hole went whoosh down at his head to take his head off, and his, he didn't see it coming presumably, or didn't have time to block with the sword, or his sword was maybe not even in his hand, who knows. Um, and this sword descended towards his head, this is a good example of where a sword is better than a gun, and the officer standing next to him went whoa, and stuck his sword, presumably a basket hilt, in the way and blocked uh, the descending tolwa and hence saved this guy's life. This guy survived uh, the mutiny, uh, went back to Britain, and um, he, I don't know why, but he decided to buy a new sword, and this was the sword he bought. So this is his second sword, or at least the sword he bought just after the mutiny. Um, this dates to uh, the early 1860s, so when he'd come back to Britain. And he decided, for whatever reason, to get a slightly bigger blade, um, and also to get a three-bar 
cavalry style or artillery style um, hilt, 1821 pattern light cavalry hilt. So there were Highland officers who decided to go against the grain and not have a basket hilt for their own personal um, preferences and reasons. An interesting detail though is on the Wilkinson ledger for this sword, which does survive fortunately, um, it does say that this did have a leather liner in it of a Highland regiment type, so a buff leather liner with, a, with an edging around it, probably red, with a blue element, and it would have originally had a tassel uh, on the back end like this one does. So this wasn't an unadulterated uh, cavalry hilt, this was a cavalry hilt which was made to look a bit Highland regiment-ish. We also know during the Crimean War one of the first recorded orders from Wilkinson was a batch of swords for, I think it was the Black Watch, but it was one of the Highland regiments, um, where they actually ordered a bunch of these cavalry hilts on Highland officer Claymore blades. So uh, don't worry about the word Claymore incidentally, I'm, I know that Claymore is commonly perceived as being a two-handed sword of the 17th century, 16th, 17th century, but um, th cl these blades were known as claymore blades in the 19th century, so I'm using the period terminology, okay, just before anyone freaks out. Um, so we know that some officers of Highland regiments preferred a cavalry hilt, and we also know that in the, probably the late 1850s or maybe 1860s, they adopted a form of hilt that was modelled on the Cinderegular cavalry, and it's the same type of hilt that was used for the Royal Engineers, so this so-called acanthus hilt. Um, this is the Brass Royal Engineers version, um, but we know that field officers, that is, and I've talked about these in previous videos, officers in Highland regiments who were major or above, so major, lieutenant colonel, colonel, right the way up to whatever, general, um, they sometimes had these um, scroll hilts on a Highland blade. Okay, so sometimes officers chose a cavalry hilt, a sabre hilt, instead of a broadsword blade. Right, now we come to the final form of hilt found on these broadsword blades. So let's go back to the basket hilt and remind you, so that's the standard officer's one. From the 1870s-ish, this is a little bit sketchy, um, but officially I think from about 1881 I think it was, they had another option. Uh, and that was to, instead of have the basket hilt, to have a replaceable, and bear in mind the nut at the end can be unscrewed, so you can throw the pommel at people and then the rightly know, it's so that you can change the hilt. So they had an option to, on field service, that is on active service rather than parade, to have one of these. And this is the sword that actually has inspired me to make this particular video. Now this, as you will see, is a cross hilt. Um, it looks like a medieval cross hilt, I won't say that this looks like a medieval sword, but bear in mind that the type of blade has been around since about 1400, um, and this type of cross hilt doesn't really look like a medieval uh, cross hilt. Let's have a little bit of a closer look at it. You can find better pictures, incidentally, on Eastern Antique Arms if you go and search in uh, on there in the sold section. So this sword is going off to a customer it's been sold. I've sold another one as well last week of these cross hilts. and. Um, they're sort of similar. So first of all, the pommel. Let's say uh, if I just grab the basket hilt for a second, you'll see that the pommels are. If I can get the camera to focus on the swords rather than. There we go. Um, you'll see that the pommels are similar. Okay, they have a cross uh, kind of filed, cross grooved in there. They have unscrewable nuts. This one's actually peened, so that's not unscrewable, but they, they are usually unscrewable. That's unscrewable. In fact, this sword I have had to remount because it was the hilt had been taken off it and put on backwards, uh, so I've corrected that. But um, those nuts can unscrew. The pommel comes off. Then you have the grip remains the same. Okay, it's a standard straight grip. And then you just replace the um, the guard. So you had the option, particularly in the 1880s and onwards, so 1880s, 90s, uh, 1900s and then into the 1910s um, and into the First World War. So usually these cross hilts date from between 1880 and the end of the First World War um, because that's the period when swords were still being carried on the battlefield but the last period that they were really carried as fighting objects. So from once we get into parade swords, people tended to, in the, later in the 20th century, only get the basket hilt for parade and not get a service hilt. Although there are exceptions to that, and Wilkinson did still make them with interchangeable hilts. 
Now there are some differences between regiments. Um, I won't go into them here because they're complicated and also I'm not sure that the research is 100% on them, but there are different styles of cross terminal end, so different types of knob basically on the end of here. Some of them have langettes that come down here for certain regiments and there are slightly different types of pommel. This is a kind of a bun shape I suppose, some of them are more conical pommel and it, there is some implication that different regiments, so Black Watch, Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, whatever, Cameronians, each had their own style of cross guard and their own style of pommel. Um, but how much this was adhered to, I call me sceptical. Okay? So uh, John Wilkinson Latham and Robert Wilkinson Latham have documented this in their books. So go online and look, search for Wilkinson Latham um, old books out of print now, but you can buy old copies fairly cheaply from places like ABE Books and even Amazon. Um, they've documented those types of cross guards and those types of pommels. But as I say, based on my experience of buying and selling antique swords and owning antique swords, over the course of how many years, 30 years, 25 years, um, I'm not so sure that people in regiments were that strictly adhering to, I think there were generic types that a lot of them bought. But anyway, um, now the cross hilt, you might think it's crazy. So I was talking to this, um, I was talking on Patreon uh, to my patrons about this in my last Patreon video. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, I do three extra videos a month on Patreon um, for people supporting the, the channel there. Very, very much appreciated and thanks to the patrons. Um, I was talking to them about that and basically I was saying that it seems counterintuitive to think that this is a field service hilt and this is a parade hilt. Doesn't that seem wacky to you that you'd have this beautifully, wonderfully protective basket hilt that had been used for centuries since the 16th century all the way in Britain, all the way through to the 19th century and protected many a hand from many a blow. And then they decide in the 1880s that, well, you know, for active service, why don't we have a simple cross hilt? And that kind of seems mad, doesn't it? Because you think, why would you give up all of that hand protection for, to have so little hand protection? Well, yes, I agree. But you have to remember Context, there we go. So we, I don't know how, how far this, through this video is before I mention the word, but there you go, context. So you've got to think about the context in which swords were carried and used on campaign in the 1880s and through World War I. And the fact is that swords weren't used an awful lot, not by infantry officers anyway. Swords were still used to some degree quite a bit by cavalry, but they weren't used very often by infantry officers. At least they weren't used to actually kill people. But even when they were, so there were certainly examples in the Sudan, in Afghanistan, um, all over, um, basically, even Boxer Rebellion maybe. Um, so there were certainly examples in the 1880s and 1890s, and even a few isolated examples in World War I as well, of infantry officers using their swords. But you have to think, okay, what's that going to look like? Okay, you've got the majority of the soldiers are shooting at each other and then say, for example, you storm a building or storm a trench, you know, rush through a breach into a fortification, this kind of thing. The close combat that happens is going to be very quick, very furious and is mostly going to be attacking. OK, they're not going to be they're not going to be you're not going to face off against someone and and fence with them. OK, you're going to be charging in, jump into a trench. There's an enemy stab. OK, there we go. That's it. <laughs> you just stabbed someone. There's someone that maybe someone swings something at your head. Parry smack. OK, that's going to be those sorts of engagements. It's going to be stab block hit this kind of very short, very quick um, actions where really how much hand protection you've got is kind of irrelevant, firstly. Secondly, most of your opponents, what are they going to be aimed, armed with? That Most of your opponents in most situations are not going to be armed with swords. They're going to be armed with a firearm with a bayonet on the end. Well, if someone's got a firearm with a bayonet in the end, your primary concern is them stabbing you. You want to try and parry that in whatever way you can. Parry, command, close and hit or stab. OK, so parry, grab, cut or, um, you know, parry, grab, stab or whatever. So these sorts of things, hand protection isn't really super important. So as I've spoken about in the past, when you add something onto a sword, in this case, a hilt, so hand protection, yes, you gain things, but you also lose something or you give up something, sacrifice something. And in this case, it's weight or mass, so you add a lot of mass to the back of the um, sword, so the sword becomes heavier, okay, and that brings the point of balance back. 
That means that, generally speaking, the sword becomes slightly less efficient at cutting because it's a little bit slower and heavier to move, and you brought the point of balance back, which gives a little bit less inertia in the tip of the blade. So actually, by putting the cross hilt on the sword, yes, you lose hand protection, but you actually end up with a much lighter and nimbler and nicely handling sword that handles really, really uh, quite well. And this example is late Victorian, probably from the 1890s, and it is service sharpened. Um, so it's got a lovely blade on it, and this actually handles much more nicely now in the hand than, to me anyway, than the basket hilt does. And also remember what we talked about. In the Victorian period, they used these swords like sabres, like with one system, with Angelo's system, with Masiello's system, weight system, Hutton's system. These are all designed primarily for the infantry officer's sabre, and in some degree, to some degree as well, the cavalry sabre on foot. Um, and you can now hold this sword like a sabre and use it like a sabre, so long as you remember you don't have as much hand protection. Um, so, you lose a lot of hand protection, yes, we shouldn't deny that, but you do gain some things as well, and these are very nice handling swords. Um, and they're very, very nimble. They feel a little bit. Do you know what they feel like? They actually feel quite similar to some of the uh, Chinese Jian. Okay? They're lighter, generally speaking, and more nimble than most medieval arming swords. Um, but, but similar. They're like a lighter, quicker version of most medieval arming swords. And probably they're a little bit quite like some side swords as well. Um, so kind of certain types of um, rapier and side sword. So they're nice swords, they're nice handling swords. Um, right, I'm not going to talk uh, any more about these types of hilts, but just to sum up, just to remind you that Highland regiments have their own type of blade, but it could be coupled with many types of hilt, types of cavalry hilt, the standard basket hilt, or the field service cross hilt. And these are very interesting, I think slightly under underappreciated types of sword. And when we're looking at why certain things were chosen, you don't always think about which is better in a one-on-one -on -one fight, which is, gives, offers you more protection. You also have to think about weight, you also have to think about the comfort of wearing it, also think about the speed of accessing. If someone's default position is their sword is being worn at their side, if someone attacks me and I need to get my sword out quickly, as George Silver says, all the way back in the year 1600 or 1599, basket hilts are harder to get your hand into quickly and access quickly. A cross hilt is quicker to get out. If, if that is a life or death difference between getting your sword out or not getting your sword out before the opponent stabs you or hits you in the head or does whatever they're going to do, then that makes this the superior weapon. So there we go. Interesting, I think. Cross hilts on Highland officer's swords and all the other Highland officer's swords. I hope this has been interesting and useful. Like I say, if you want to see more uh, pretty pictures of these and close-ups of these, have a look on the Eastern Antique Arms website linked below. Um, and you can also, of course, see swords that are for sale there, but I've also got a bunch of articles in the research, research section, which hopefully you'll find interesting. Thanks for watching. Give us a like and a subscribe. Share the video around, and I'll see you again soon on Scholar Gladiator channel for another video. Take care folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.